Before I introduce the co-chairs, just a couple of brief words about the initiative. Uh, launched roughly one year ago, uh, the McCreary Pomeroy SSDI Solutions Initiative is a project dedicated to identifying practical policy changes to improve the Social Security Disability Insurance Program and other services for people with disabilities. Today's conference is a cornerstone event of this initiative where the many ideas that have been commissioned will be presented publicly for the first time. Our co-chairs will talk more about our initiative and the goals for this project in a minute, but just leave briefly, I want to make sure I thank uh, everyone that made this event possible today. I want to thank the District Architecture Center for hosting us in this beautiful space, and thank my fellow staff, uh, discussants, authors, advisory council members, speakers, and others who have helped make this event possible. And of course, I'd like to thank our uh, co-chairs, Jim McCreary and Earl Pomeroy. As former chairs of the Social Security Subcommittee during their time in Congress, we knew that as co-chairs they would bring not only a strong knowledge of the SSDI program, but also the leadership, experience, and bipartisan solutions-oriented approach necessary to make this initiative a success. And most importantly, as anyone who has worked with them on these issues can attest, they both bring a steadfast commitment to ensuring that SSDI continues to serve its vital function in providing support for people with disabilities and their families. On behalf of staff, I could say it's been an incredible honor to work with and for such dedicated public servants. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our co-chairs, uh, Jim McCrary and Earl Pomeroy. Thank you, Mike. Well, I was privileged to serve nine terms in the House, representing North Dakota. And on the best days of that experience, you'd go to the Capitol with this sense that the day's work might somehow, some way, help move the ball forward just a little bit in the great path of this country. You know, you may think that sounds a little corny, but I actually feel like we have that same possibility today. Because we're going to be talking about the Social Security Disability Insurance Program, SSDI, at a time when its solvency is uh, drawing thin and legislative action will be required in 2016. When the Center for Responsible Federal Budget first approached me about participating in this project, uh, I wondered what, where they were coming from. Uh, I wasn't much interested in being part of something that we're going to go off and without the pressure of elected politics, you know, sit in a room and think grand thoughts and come up with one-size-fits-all solutions. And uh, I was assured by project managers uh, led by uh, Mike Murphy, Ed Lorenz, and a number of others have made such great efforts into this project, uh, that that wasn't the case and it wasn't the case at all. That with legislative action imminent and certain, there will be action taken next year, absolutely. Uh, it's an opportunity to improve the program and not offering any ideas, not exploring ways where pro improvements could be made. It was just a chance too good to pass up. We, we had to take advantage of this opportunity. Uh, I was persuaded by that view. Others have another view. This program is critically important to the 11 million people whose income uh, is largely dependent completely on an income stream that averages less than $14,000 a year, and they have no hope or expectation or, or opportunity for employment beyond that. Some have said that this program is so critically important in the lives of those recipients that it's just too critical to fiddle with. Uh, reallocation between trust funds to keep it solvent, but we don't even dare talk about anything else. I respect that view. I disagree with it. And we tried to, at all points, make certain the concerns that were fueling that kind of viewpoint were tended to, and the steps included. Having a diverse advisory committee of strong, experienced leaders in this area uh, that would make certain uh, the needs of that population were, were held at the forefront of what we were doing. Uh, we were going to subject, at every point, the research as it proceeded to rigorous 
peer review analysis, concluding with a public session, today's session, which really isn't a, a, the great unveiling. This is a work in progress, and today represents another day of work. Uh, we want your points. The ideas will be floated publicly for the first time. They'll be discussed, debated, and your input gathered. This work isn't done yet. Uh, today and following, your input would be useful. You know, in baseball, there's a concept of small ball. You advance with a bunt, you steal a base, maybe a bloop single. You don't get up to the plate, swing for the fences. And that's the analogy I like to think about, the McCreary-Pomeroy SSDI initiative. We're, we're trying to advance in increments, a menu of really honed ideas that have been circulated, tested, peer reviewed, like I mentioned. Uh, and then the policymakers will decide. Uh, Jim and I will put a wrapper on the, on the work, and we might suggest uh, some framework that, that could go forward, but we're certainly not going to roll this out as a, uh, here, we fix it. We're not even talking about solvency. Some may have a slightly positive effect on solvency. Some may have a slightly negative effect on solvency. Solvency isn't what this is about at all. You'll see that from the topic selected and the research conducted. It is about advancing the ball for a better program. To those of you in the room, and I'm looking around at a very sophisticated audience of, first of all, our advisory committee members, thank you so much for participating. Your work has been critical. For the researchers themselves, we've kind of harnessed you up as thought leaders and sent you off into the world of research and study and thinking. You know, this doesn't always happen before legislative matters are brought to the fore. Uh, so we think you've given us, right from the starting gate, a much better starting point to look at ideas that really have some merit to them. Uh, and then to all of you who've come in today, many from around the country and some at, at, at some difficulty, uh, to participate and add your ideas, we're really, really grateful to you. One of the things, aside from uh, my passion for the SSDI program that made this project uh, one I wanted to work on, was the chance to work once more with Jim McCreary, a uh, well-respected congressman from Louisiana, pretty hard to spend an entire run in Congress, and, and leave with both parties, respecting you as an individual and, and viewing the work that you've done while in the halls of Congress as thoughtful and intelligent and measured. Uh, that's the kind of record Jim McCreary had. It was my pleasure to work with him, my pleasure to serve on Social Security Subcommittee when he chaired it. And so it's my pleasure to serve with him once more as the chairman. It's here now from my co-chair, Jim McCreary. Uh, thanks, Earl, for those kind words. And uh, of course, uh, all of those of you who know Earl know that I could say the same thing right back at Earl. And uh, I certainly would uh, second Earl's uh, contention that it's folks like Earl who helped move that ball forward in Congress. And indeed, uh, those days that we could leave the halls of Congress knowing that we had made some progress, uh, incremental as it might be, those, those were good days. And of course, uh, when you were in the minority, as both Earl and I were uh, at times, at different times, um, that feeling was even greater when you could participate and contribute as a member of the minority to moving the ball forward. So uh, it's in that spirit that Earl and I uh, accepted the invitation from the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget to chair uh, this SSDI Solutions Initiative. Uh, but I would be remiss if I didn't say that Earl and I, wh while we're the co-chairs, the real work that's being done uh, behind the scenes is the staff uh, at the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. They're doing the bulk of the work. And then, of course, uh, our advisory council members who have been very active, uh, and the, all of those of you who uh, are contributing to this initiative through your expertise uh, applied to papers that uh, you're preparing. So thank you to all of you uh, who are participating, and thank you uh, to all of you who are uh, visiting with us today. 
As Earl said, this is kind of the capstone to a year-long effort so far. Uh, and so I'm going to try to explain how we got to where we are, uh, what you'll hear about today, and where we will go after today. Uh, as Earl said, we, we wanted to take advantage of this opportunity, uh, this legislative opportunity. We knew that Congress would be addressing in some form or fashion uh, the SSDI trust fund. So recognizing that, uh, we wanted to leverage uh, that opportunity by bringing in experts uh, in the field, academics, uh, people with great experience uh, with SSDI, uh, and ask them to participate with us in an effort to set out a menu of things that policymakers might consider to make the SSDI program better, stronger. Uh, and as Earl said, some of those things might uh, uh, reduce the cost of the program over time. Some of those things might increase the cost over time. But we wanted just a, a menu of, of good ideas fleshed out that policymakers could consider. So with the help of our advisory council, uh, made up of, of those experts, academics, and people with great experience, we've narrowed down submissions uh, of papers to 12. And those 12 papers, uh, or at least the ideas for those papers, will be presented uh, today. Um, these papers are, offer a lot of different ideas and perspectives, but they're broadly centered around four themes. How to encourage early intervention, how to improve SSDI program administration, how to improve interaction with other programs, public and private, and lastly, ideas on broader structural reforms to the program. Now, importantly, we recognize that these papers do not represent an exhaustive list of ideas that uh, exist surrounding SSDI. And it's not our intention as co-chairs or as advisory council members to endorse everything that you're going to hear today. Rather, we intended this uh, project to put forward a menu of different ideas worthy of discussion, vetting, and debate. Now, these papers have already gone through somewhat of a vetting process by expert peer reviewers, uh, and today uh, they'll be responded to by discussants. And I encourage everyone here to be active participants today so that the authors of the papers can put forward the best ideas possible. After today, our authors will finalize their papers in the coming weeks, and later this year, our project will issue a final publication that includes all the final papers as well as key findings uh, in a co-chair chapter from Earl and me. So, I look forward to all of us having a great dialogue today and continuing that dialogue over the next several weeks and months. And now it's a pleasure for me to introduce a very special guest uh, this morning who has consented to come by for a few minutes and visit with us, uh, taking a break from his terribly busy schedule as chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, a gentleman who has worked tirelessly over the years uh, to move the ball forward, as Earl and I have both talked about, in a very bipartisan way. Uh, he's a gentleman that uh, is a gentleman, uh, but uh, he has certainly earned the respect of people on both sides of the aisle uh, over many, many years in the United States Congress. Uh, so please help me welcome to our conference today, Senator Orrin Hatch. This is an honor for me to be with you here today, and especially on this very important subject. And I thank Jim for that kind introduction uh, for and for having me here today, as well as Congressman Pomeroy. I, I give my sincere thanks to both of them for their continued devotion to American workers, including those uh, receiving disability benefits, and to finding solutions for the challenges facing the Social Security Disability Insurance Program. As we all know, Social Security in general, and the DI program in particular, face financial challenges that need to be addressed. In Social Security overall, there are close to $11 trillion 
of unfunded obligations over the next uh, 75 years, and nearly $26 trillion in liabilities in present value terms if you look over the infinite horizon. The Social Security's Board of Trustees, which includes several members of, the pres of President Obama's cabinet, recommend that uh, the sooner we act to put Social Security on a sustainable financial path, the better it will be for all Americans. And I certainly agree with that. With respect to the DI Trust Fund in particular, we have known for years that it will be depleted by the end of uh, next year. And given this impending depletion, I've been working with stakeholders, including many in this room, for some time now to examine our options and to help determine uh, what reforms will be best, will work best. Together with Chairman Ryan of the House Ways and Means Committee and Chairman Johnson of the Social Security Subcommittee, I've solicited in input from experts uh, in meetings and continue to welcome ideas, including those submitted to a special email address we have set up pre precisely to receive input on how to improve the DI program and make it work better for beneficiaries. And I will be very interested in what you folks come up with uh, here as well. Uh, it seems to me this is where we're really going to make some headway down here. Now we already have, uh, we're already in August and we have uh, plenty of time throughout last year and this year at the very least to work on bipartisan solutions. And while many experts and specialists, including a number of you, have been working with me, the Obama administration mostly continues to sit this effort out. Frankly, I don't understand how that helps uh, current and future beneficiaries in, the important, in this important program. The last time that Congress acted to address the DI program and its finances was in the, was in the mid 1990s when we reshuffled uh, some funds to temporarily shore up, shore up the uh, DI Trust Fund and pledged to use the next couple of decades to put the DI program on a steadier fiscal course. I'm sure it's no shock to anyone here to learn that that pledge has not been fulfilled. <laughs> now, with another impending depletion of the DI Trust Fund, some, including the administration, proposed to reshuffle the funds yet again in order to buy ourselves another 10 to 15 years so that the DI and retirement trust funds will exhaust at the same time, and to pledge yet again to fix things in the interim. Ultimately, the proposal would kick uh, the, proverbial, the proverbial can even further down the road, something that even President Obama said we should not do with Social Security. In my view, a payroll tax reallocation with no accompanying reforms is not a proven winning strategy. And while I can't stand here today and outline a specific plan to, uh, to sustain the DI Trust Fund for a long term, I will tell you where my focus has been as I've worked with my colleagues and outside experts to address this problem. They didn't think we could get the money for the highway, though, either. The Democrats were quite sure that they could embarrass us on that particular bill. And not only did we get the money, I found $82 billion in really, really good uh, offsets. It shook them all up, and we finally, uh, I think, are on our way to getting a highway bill done. And from my vantage point, there are three avenues we can go down to improve the DI program. I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm doing something wrong. The first, we can work to modernize the program. For example, as most of you know, Social Security's medical guidelines and vocational grids are woefully out of date. While the Social Security Administration says that it is working on updates, I believe that further work and emphasis is necessary to ensure that the program is up to date and becomes more nimble in adapting to changes in medical findings and ever-evolving labor markets. Second, we can make it easier for willing DI beneficiaries to explore opportunities to return to work. Of course, not all DI beneficiaries are able to work, and no one would expect that to be the case. However, there are some beneficiaries who want to explore their options, but the return to work rules in the DI program are enormously complex, and the program's orientation seems more toward making beneficiaries prove what they cannot do rather than allowing them to see what they may uh, be able to achieve. Clearly, it would be difficult to change it will be difficult to change this orientation. And I'm not so na naive as to think that Congress uh, can put forward changes today that will change this direction on a dime. 
It will be an ongoing effort. However, if we believe these types of changes will better serve beneficiaries and want to see them happen, there is no time like the present to begin the work. This is an important conference as far as I'm concerned. The third and final avenue for DI reform that I'll talk about today is enhancing program integrity by improving decision making and adjudication within the program and building upon existing efforts to deter and prevent fraud. We all know there's plenty of fraud in this program. Recent problems, including large-scale fraud conspiracies in the DI program, present clear evidence that we must remain vigilant to work against fraud and give Social Security and its Inspector General the tools they need to address these problems. And while fraud is not a silver bullet for all of the, uh, or fighting fraud is not a, civil, uh, a silver bullet for all of the DI program's fiscal problems, we need to acknowledge that if the American people view DI as a program rife with fraud, public support for the program will erode to the detriment of deserving beneficiaries. With these three avenues of reform in mind, I've put forth a number of bills uh, that I think might advance the discussion on DI reform. I intend to introduce three more DI bills today. And while I don't have time to discuss all of these bills right now, I urge everyone here as well as my colleagues in Congress and the administration to examine these efforts and to work with me to find solutions. And once you examine my efforts, two things will become clear. One, while I acknowledge the DI program's financial challenges, I don't engage in fear-mongering in an effort to manufacture a crisis. And two, I have not uh, once proposed to, quote, slash, unquote, benefits, nor am I seeking to privatize anything. I'll put privatize in quotes as well. I have to make these points clear because if you haven't already, you will likely hear charges from some of my colleagues as well as outside identical groups or ideological groups that Republicans are trying to create a DI crisis out of thin air so that we can justify massive cuts to DI benefits or turn the pro program into a private Wall Street giveaway. This approach is mostly about scoring political points and is short on actual workable answers, which is truly unfortunate and certainly does not help beneficiaries of the DI program. Now, my hope is that eventually we can set aside the rhetoric in order to craft bipartisan solutions to SSDI's financial challenges and hopefully end up with improvements that will make the program work better for the beneficiaries. Anyone familiar with the DI Trust Fund understands that more resources will have to go into the fund if we're going to prevent across the board benefit cuts of around 20% next year. And I believe it will be irresponsible to wait until late next year to begin to act. As I said earlier, any reallocation of, of uh, resources uh, toward the DI Trust Fund should be coupled with real reforms so that we're not just procrastinating while we cross our fingers and hope that we'll somehow do a better job in 10 or 15 years. Therefore, the question should not uh, be whether additional resources will have to be reallocated to the DI Trust Fund to prevent large benefit cuts. The important question is, what will we agree on as a set of provisions that will accompany such a reallocation? For my part, I've been hard at work for some time now developing some proposals and investigating various possible pilot programs, and I will continue to work with my colleagues toward real solutions. I'm willing to work with anyone. I think you've seen that. I don't care what party you belong to. I don't care what your philosophy is. I'm willing to work with anyone to try and solve these problems and to ensure that benefits continue to be paid to disabled American workers and their families. I am working and I will continue to work to make absolutely certain that the 20 percent uh, benefit cut facing disabled workers under current law will not occur. I think it should go without saying that these efforts will benefit tremendously from the hard work all of you have been putting in to come up with ideas and proposals. I'm looking forward to your ideas. And none of that would have occurred without the leadership of Congressman McCrory and Congressman Pomeroy to whom I'm very grateful and for whom I have the highest respectful opinions, having seen them act up there on Capitol Hill. Uh, both are tr 
terrific people, I'm, I'm grateful you have them with you. I can assure you that I value your insights and your ideas and will give everything that is developed in, a, in the SSDI Solutions Initiative very serious consideration. And I'm not the only one. I mean, we have a very, very, very smart, tough, and highly intelligent committee with really great people in the Congress on the Finance Committee. And I think the same holds true of the Ways and Means Committee over in the House. And you could not have a better chairman than, than Paul Ryan over in the House. We work regularly together. We get together almost on a weekly basis in his office or my office, and also with, uh, with uh, Congressman Wyden as well, or Senator Wyden as well. All I can say is that uh, I appreciate the work that you're doing and the attention that you're paying to trying to help make the DI program work better for current and future beneficiaries. Of course, I'd love to stay for some of your discussions, but I have to go now and save the republic. <laughs> thank you for having me here today, and thank you for taking the time to listen.